As a witness to history, she has covered all eight presidents since John F. Kennedy and has served as a correspondent for UPI for 57 years. Once named one of the 25 most influential women in America, she's become an outspoken critic of today's political environment. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with award-winning journalist and best-selling author, Helen Thomas. collective group, would you say the men that have been president of the United States are people you would enjoy spending time with? Uh, well, there are others I may prefer. Really? <laughs> are they fascinating individuals? Presidents are fascinating because they have so much power and how they use it and how they define their roles, I think, are eternally fascinating. And uh, they're so all of them are so secretive, though. You, it's it's work to try to find out who they are and why they are. Have you seen it change through the years, the way the presidents approach things? Every president is different and puts his own stamp on, on the uh, White House. And I, I think that more and more they're feeling empowered. Mm -hmm. There is more and more power. They're taking more, more, more and more power. But they're taking it. Are we giving it to them as people, though? Are we allowing them to do this? To yes, have... we are. Not, not. I'm not, but Congress is acquiescing, and I think that's a great fault. Why do you think that's happening, though? 9-11. 9-11 changed everything. It justified everything. The fear card. Uh, the presidents always have, you know, pointing out that there is terrorism and, and enemies and so forth. He's grabbed power that yeah. he shouldn't have wiretapping us, torture, we don't torture, he says, and there is proof before your very eyes. Yeah. Where were you when 9-11 hit? I was in Washington. I was about to go off uh, on a trip, and uh, of course, all hell broke loose, and from then on, we were all on the story. At the moment it happened, what were your thoughts? I thought it was an accident because I had been filing a UPI wire when a small plane hit the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was almost uh, deja vu all over again. I had no idea that it, this would be an attack. Yeah. In general, though, as, as the story developed and you learned more, did you have any idea that our country would end up the, reacting the way we did, that our government would go no, in the direction. No, I didn't. And I think that everybody rose to the occasion. It was an incredible thing to be attacked on our own home grounds and so forth. But I do think that all the restrictions that have come along have been very undemocratic, really, in terms of how you treat your fellow man. Yeah. Take me all the Loss way back. Loss of our civil liberties and so forth. Yeah. Take me all the way back. When did you know this was something you wanted to pursue with your life? High school, when I saw my byline in the high school paper when I was a sophomore, my ego swelled. <laughs> and I started working on the school paper, which is usually the track for yeah. journalists, potential journalists. I love the ambiance of working on a paper, the camaraderie, the fact that I could be nosy, <laughs> all of these things. I said, this is it. It combined everything, and you also have a tremendous sense of independence. Everything rides on you. Everything you do, basically, takes a certain amount of independence, and you know that your, your performance is on the front page every day. Is it a natural curiosity? Is that what makes it work for you? I think that everyone has curiosity, but I think I'm nosier than a lot of people. <laughs> How do you know when to stop being nosy? How do you know how far to push it? I don't think you should ever stop having curiosity. That's the essence of life, to keep learning. And that's what journalism gives you. You have to keep learning. It's an education every day. Yeah. The first president that you covered intently was JFK. Kennedy, right. And you covered him while he was president-elect, correct? Is that where it started? I did. How did you see him change from being president-elect into the office, or did he, he change? It's one of the few presidents I really feel truly learned 
on it's on the job training always but in this case he made the quantum leap into statesmanship from the bay of pigs to the cuban missile crisis yeah do we see that kind of growth anymore in people especially in elected depends office depends on the person i haven't seen it here yeah no are, are the right people getting involved in politics and i ask that question because it seems like a long time ago there was an idea of what it meant to be in politics and to go out there and work for fellow Public man. service. Yeah, and today you get the feeling that's not there. I think that the it's detracting really to know the obscene amount of money that it takes to run for public office. Great people can't do that. I mean, how do you, you put the arm on everybody and uh, you owe so much back to your donors and so forth. I think it's very inhibiting from that aspect. Also, the total exposure. Uh, I used to say that if you want to run for public office, you should decide at the age of five (laughs) and live accordingly, knowing that uh, everything will come back to haunt you. Was there ever a point you wanted to run for office? Never. Never even entertained the idea? I my nose against the window pane watching others. <laughs> no, I, I've never aspired to high office, or any office, public office. Was there ever a time you came across something that you didn't publish? I won't ask what it is, but were there those moments where you thought this really shouldn't be sent out? I don't think so. I mean, I, I certainly didn't. Uh, I worked for 57 years for a wire service where you had to be accurate, you had to stick to the facts, and uh, you couldn't uh, freelance in any other way. You knew you had to seek the truth. So I don't think that uh, I was hesitant about writing what I saw and and observed and heard. But uh, and I don't think there are any... Anyway, today there are no lines drawn. Everybody's in on the act. Everyone with a laptop thinks they're a journalist. They're all... So it's very hard to distinguish. Do we have too much information out there that isn't verified? When you talk about everyone having a laptop and everyone can publish and everyone can get a word out, do we lose sense of what's fact? I don't think there's such a thing as too much information. But I do think that you have to be discerning and you have to know whether it's propaganda or it's real information or it's the truth. And you have to be able to check it out. It has to be accurate. It should be. I'm going to take you back now to high school. So you finish up. You're working in the school newspaper. At that time, you decide to go to college. Every woman didn't go to college. Why did you know that was a path for you? Everyone in my family was bound and determined to have an education. We had parents who couldn't read or write, but they were brilliant in my opinion. They wanted everyone in our family to be educated. They knew the essence. That's the the passport to a better life as LBJ used to say, and uh, so we were very lucky. We all went to college, and uh, it wouldn't have been any other way in our family. Yeah. If you hadn't gone to college, it probably would have been a much different life for you, huh? I think that um, it isn't a question of college. It's a question of always wanting to keep learning, education. Yeah. And after college, then, you started what you were a copy girl, correct? Mm -hmm. The newspaper? $17.50 Seventeen fifty a week, and I thought I had arrived, <laughs> running to get coffee, cutting copy from the teletype machines then, clack, clack, clack. And uh, so I, I loved it, and I thought, uh, I mean, this is it. I would have swept the floors just when, getting a foot in the door. When you look at the stories you were covering back in the beginning, and you looked at the way the people, the politicians you were dealing with covered what they were doing and the information came out, and you look at it today, are we still having similar types of people in these positions? Is it still the same group of people that are running the government, or did something change somewhere? Running the government? Running the government, being in elected office. I guess those are two different things sometimes. I think that the greatest generation was the 20th century. Two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, and so forth. You had people dedicated totally and the Great Depression. I mean, we made such strides in terms of human rights, civil rights, women's rights, despite the fact that we had two, two, two major wars. It was a, a century of incredible contribution on the part of mankind. But the President Roosevelt, of course, made the greatest contribution in turn on domestic policy 
and World War II, but domestic policy, he pulled us out of the Great Depression. And he also had a great sense of humanitarianism. And I think that LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, made the greatest contribution in the last half of the 20th century. In his first two years in office, on the tailwind of the Kennedy assassination, he was able to ram through Congress Medicare, the Civil Rights Act, voting rights for blacks for the first time in the South, federal aid to education at all levels from Head Start through college, public housing, the national parks, environmental laws, and so forth. Yeah. To put that floor beyond which people don't starve in this country, lack for ed education or shelter, was the great society his, his dream. Could a man like him be elected today? Uh, absolutely. We're waiting for someone with great ideals again, not just wanting to be president, but why? Yeah. Are there those people out there, though, do you think? I think there's always that, those kind of people in, in society. But the whole question of running now is so tough. Yeah. And you have to understand what the stakes are, and as I say, the money, the fact that you'll be totally exposed, your bank accounts, your family, everything you've ever done will be open. Yeah. When you think about Nixon, and you think about the way a lot of people remember him, and he seems to have gone through a couple remakings as time has gone on since his presidency, do you think all of the presidents have been remembered accurately? Accurately? Yeah. Yes. They are just representation. I don't see how they could not be. I mean, everything is on the record. Everything's on tape. Everything's on television. Everything. There it is. Yeah. Tell everything me a little about... they do. They're totally covered every minute, practically. Although they also are very secretive, and they do a lot of things in secret that affect our lives, unfortunately. Tell me about the Nixon administration. It was very secretive, and uh, in the end, it was uh, the president, the first president in American history, Richard Nixon, was forced to resign for the abuse of power. But his abuse of power involved his political ambitions and so forth. This, what we see today, is taking us into a war where it's much more bigger phenomena. Every American is affected. Yeah. Do you think what happened with the Nixon administration should have? Absolutely. Do you think that what happened in the, in the Nixon administration was isolated to that administration? Yes, yeah. I do. There's, uh, I think there's been corruption and abuse of power in other administrations, but not to that extent. How about President Ford? He restored confidence and uh, a certain amount of stability in our government and in the Oval Office and the White House after in the aftermath of what he called the long national nightmare, which was the Watergate scandal. So he made a great contribution. Was it hard to go through all the years that you couldn't express your opinion or didn't feel free to express your opinion to hold that inside? Or if we got you at no, a dinner party... I never party, held it inside. I, I shouted from the rooftops. I just didn't put it in my copy. Oh. <laughs> I wrote straight news. Is it hard to separate then? when you have a strong opinion about something, to not end I didn't up... bow out of the human race when I became a reporter. I permitted myself to think, to care, to believe, but I never put it in my copy. That's why I thought the people, American people, deserve the straight story insofar as it's humanly possible and just the facts. Mm -hmm. Now I write my opinion. Is that more liberating for you? Oh, absolutely, but it was much more difficult. I mean, I was uh, I, when I first started writing the column, I was writing it so straight that the editor <laughs> said, where's the edge? I said, the what? Your opinion. My what? <laughs> it floored me. Are you comfortable sharing your opinion then in the media? Absolutely. To... Yeah, no problem with that, huh? <laughs> no, I shout from the rooftops. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about Carter's administration. Carter put human rights as the centerpiece of our foreign policy. He gave us a sense of great dignity. He told foreign dictators, especially in Latin America, that if they continued to abuse political prisoners, torture them, and so forth, we would cut off aid, and he did. He's won the Nobel Peace Prize. He's in demand everywhere in the world on, by both sides in all disputes because they know it would be fair. Yeah. 
in your position through the years, how well do you get to know these individuals as presidents personally? You're really on the outside looking in. You don't know. You know, once Marlon Fitzwater, who was press secretary to Ronald Reagan, said, the press, they only know 5% of what goes on around here. So I used to repeat that in speeches. And he came to me and said, but the other 95% is wasn't worth knowing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. We know very little. A soup's on. Yeah. We know their public life, but we, there's a lot that goes on. And uh, presidents have a lot of authority to issue secret orders, executive orders, that will be in the archives for 50 years before we know them, what they are. Can you get a feeling, though, with the experience you've had, how certain presidents would have handled things when you first get to know them? When, when the current president came into office... Was there a sense, because of all of your background, you could figure out what was going to happen? I don't think you can always figure it out, because some really rise to the occasion. Some act in a crisis as as they should, and some don't. So it's very hard to predict until you're actually there. Yeah. Reagan seemed to bring in quite a show as being president. How did you see it? I thought that he certainly enjoyed the job, but he he remained... Reagan, which was chairman of the board. He delegated duties and responsibilities. He counted on his aides a lot. I mean, more than I thought he should. And um, I must say that even though he said the Soviet Union was the evil empire, I was very happy that he suddenly moved toward rapprochement. And when he went to Moscow uh, at the urging of his wife, then he began to see that the Russians were not bears who walked like men. They were human beings. And he noted that they laughed and they cried and they were human. So there was a new awakening for him, a learning game, really. And when we came back to Washington, I said to him, Mr. President, don't you think if you had gone to Moscow 10 years ago, he used to say, oh, they laugh, they cry, they're human. So I said, don't you think if you had gone to Moscow 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you might have found out? The Russians laugh, they cry, they're human. He said, nope, they've changed. (laughs) (laughs) No, but he he learned a lot. And the olive branch was much more than the, you know, both barrels. Yeah. Then there was Bush 41. Feelings on that presidency? I thought he did a good job. And I think that he certainly knew foreign affairs. And he also knew when to stop. He knew not to go on to get Baghdad after liberating Kuwait. He had, and he didn't go into the war until he had 28 nations in a co- coalition, which was, I mean, proof that we had the backing of the world, really. So he also took the good advice and probably his own best thing, the instincts that there would be a civil war in Baghdad and, and Iraq if we went further, that they would be involved in house-to-house fighting and so forth. How do past administrations communicate with current ones? Is there any that you see that goes well, back and forth? They, there is, it's a very exclusive club where pe- presidents have mutual sympathy because they feel that each one, that it's, they were in the special realm of life. And um, they begin to understand one another and they even become great friends. Yeah, which brings me now to Clinton. You were very disappointed with what ended up happening in Clinton's administration, correct? Well, I think everyone was disappointed because I think they had a chance for greatness. And But at the same time, I've never seen any president more tyr- tyrannized and investigated than Clinton. The right wing didn't give him one second of peace. From the moment he stepped into the White House, he was investigated. They denied him legitimacy from the moment he became president because they had held, the Republicans had held the news, held the White House for um, 12 years and they thought it belonged to them. As a reporter, though, where do you draw the line? What do you go after? What do you check on a president? What do you ask and do? Well, as a a columnist now, I can just observe what's going on and give my opinion. Right. But back when you weren't a columnist, when you were a reporter. Just write it straight. He said, she said, he added, and so forth, just straight. 
Yeah, but you used to ask a lot of questions, too. Sure, I and you did. didn't stop. That was my role. I mean, it was important to ask. Right. So but what that, areas were off limits? Were there things that you didn't ask, or were there things, everything was fair game? Nothing is off story? limits. When somebody's in power, I mean, they, uh, they're they acting on our behalf. But then, they act in the name of the American people, and they're accountable for that. But what about the private? Do they lose their private life when they become... They Should gotta be. know that. Don't run for president. You want to be have a private life. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to bring you to a, a favorite topic of yours: the current president. So, how do you feel his presidency is going? Badly, because I don't like uh, a war that is preemptive war. I don't think we should go into a country that didn't do anything to us, killed the people, call them terrorists because they're fighting for their own country. A lot of them. What do you think, then, is the motivation, though, behind the position we're currently it's in? It's a question I've asked the president himself, and I don't know. When you ask a question, though, do you have an idea of what the answer is you're expecting hmm. to hear, or do you ask open-ended? I think you're tr when you ask a question, I think you're truly seeing. I mean, we're not playing games here. This is war and peace. We're talking about life and death. No, I ask the question very sincerely. I think the American people, after three and a half years, ought to know why we're in a war, when every reason given so far has been repudiated, and not so. Is there an answer you're expecting to hear, besides one that is no answer, but is I'm there one I'm beginning to hear oil more. I mean, Pre President Bush, is, in the last two news conferences, has warned about the whole question of oil, that the, what the kind of blackmail that we would suffer if the terrorists got hold of the oil. But that wasn't the original reason for going. It was weapons of mass destruction, ties to the Al-Qaeda terrorists, we told, threats from Saddam Hussein, which not so. I mean, third world country did not threat the world's only military superpower. Right. So everything has fallen about the wayside. Now uh, spreading democracy. Well, you don't spread democracy and liberty with the barrel of a gun. We did it. With the Cold War, with ideas, exchange students, exchange teachers, the Pope, rap music, uh, the Beatles, whatever, that exchange of ideas, and that we opened the window, and so did uh, the Soviets. Yeah. Uh, Gorbachev. What do you look to now in the future? Who do you think on the horizon looks like a good hope for president? There are several people running. I haven't made a choice, but I do think that... Uh, you only hope that they realize what that job is. It's the top of the mark. Ain't no other place to go. And you should only want to do the right thing for people. Yeah. How do you enjoy writing books? Tough. <laughs> it's a lot longer than a column, isn't it? <laughs> it's much better. Um, you have a great sense of relief that you've finished it. It's an accomplishment. And then you don't realize you have to sell it. <laughs> Marketing is is the, is the get out there and beat the bushes. But uh, no pun that intended. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, it's it's, um, it's fun in a way. It's work, as the president says. Hard work. Yeah. It's hard work to be president. Hard work to write a book. But the whole idea of hawking it and selling it is uh, a little. Yeah. Out of my account. Do you ever look back and wish or thought you should have done something different with your life, or are you very happy with the choice you made? Are you kidding? <laughs> Anyone in journalism has only regrets when they leave that profession. It's the most rewarding. It's exciting. It's an education every day. You never want to quit because you're so involved, and, it's, and you do feel it's a public service. Do you ever feel, though, you sacrifice things in your life to have this career? No. No? How did you balance it all, then? Well, I got married very late in life. I'm a widow, and uh, so I didn't really. But I see a lot of women are doing it. They're doing it. I mean, there's no reason to give up love, marriage, and so forth because you have a profession you like. It can be done. Women are doing it every day. What about retirement? What about it? Yeah. <laughs> Anything... When are you going to retire? Well, I think some people wish sooner than later. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I like working. Yeah. I don't know why I can't still keep working. And you can, and you continue to ask the question. Does it hurt when you're, in, when you're not sitting in that front row seat? No, it doesn't hurt. 
You only wish that people would uh, ask the questions. It's annoying when they don't and they pass up a good opportunity because it, you know, it means a lot. Yeah. It's important to pin down a president and make him accountable. Do you have hope in the future? I always have hope. I don't see how you could live without hope. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to sit down and talk sure. with us today. You're welcome. Helen Thomas. Mm -hmm. Order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send six ninety five to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.